I have written a chapter called Education for All and the Comparative Sociology of Schooling. And this chapter looks at uh, two countries in Africa, Tanzania and Kenya, and the development of mass education in those countries. What I wanted to do in the chapter was to engage teacher education students in a discussion about educational inequality and about the reasons for the expansion of mass education. And both of those things can be accomplished very well by looking at the examples of educational change and development in the developing world. The first part of the chapter looks at the expansion of mass education and asks the question, what drives the expansion of mass schooling? And drawing from the sociological and historical literatures, we uh, compare some of the different theories about why schooling has uh, expanded so rapidly around the world. Uh, some people describe it as a very homogenous or almost monocultural system. Uh, in the chapter, uh, I look at uh, liberal and functionalist accounts that credit the expansion of schooling to the rise of a modern economy, at uh, conflict or neo-Marxist approaches that think about schooling primarily as a form of class imposition uh, in which uh, schools produce laborers for a capitalist world system. And I also uh, consider institutionalist or state theoretical models that look at schooling as something that is mainly driven by the desires of a national uh, bureaucracy and a national elite, producing a common allegiance and national loyalty in aid of the modern state. So we talk a little bit at the beginning about those two, uh, those three uh, paradigms. But in addition, we also want to look at how come parents and children themselves demand access to schooling. And that is a fourth paradigm which focuses on the role played by uh, popular demand and popular social movements in the creation of not just mass education, but the notion of education for all, uh, equitable education for all. So these are the thematic or the theoretical starting points for the chapter. And then we turn back and look at the Tanzanian and the Kenyan cases, contrasting cases in that uh, Tanzania took a socialist path and Kenya a capitalist path to development. Uh, Tanzania decided to develop a very broad base to its educational system where every child would have access to primary school. Kenya decided to focus much more heavily in investing in secondary and higher education. Sometime in the 80s, of course, both countries faced a period of very severe uh, economic crisis, debt crisis, and their educational systems had to be uh, transformed as part of a structural adjustment process. In those in both cases, then, the schools uh, adopted a set of reforms that looked quite similar, so they lost some of their uh, early variation. But one of the most uh, striking features in both countries is the fact that uh, access to schooling actually declined or deteriorated in the course of the 1980s. So the question of education for all, something that we often take for granted, is thrown into relief in these two countries, which had actually achieved universal primary education, but saw universal primary education uh, become something that was not a right or not a universal right in the period uh, between 1980 and the end of the 90s. We also talk a little bit about uh, the role of the international community in trying to make sure that ensure that children in these countries uh, uh, have the right to education. And the supplemental readings to the chapter uh, raise some questions about how, how uh, positive international influence has been in the achievement of education for all. One of the themes is really about how schools sort kids into different life paths and into different uh, life chances. And I think by looking at the way this sorting process happens, not just on the basis of a national level, but also internationally is important. So that becomes one of the themes of the chapters. Um, is it better to have vocational education and have children sorted into a certain occupational status? Or should they have a broad uh, liberal ed education uh, giving them access to everything? Is that feasible in the poorest countries of the world? Is it even feasible in uh, very wealthy countries like Canada? I think that in Canada we operate in a context in which the idea that education is for all is very much a taken for granted. Uh, notion. And pre-service students, uh, nonetheless, will come into contexts in which, in fact, they will see disparity, a great deal of inequality and disparity. They will see a variety of uh, forces pushing, ch uh, pushing both expansion and 
the type of reforms in an educational system, and this whole chapter gives them a chance to reflect on how come this system looks like it does, what kind of sorting machine is it, why do parents and communities want more or different types of education. So it acts as a foil for them to think about uh, the kinds of stratification, uh, sorting that happens in schools, but also the kinds of uh, hopeful uh, entitlements that go along with the notion of education for all, not just at, in the Canadian context, but in the world context.